Businesses thrive by knowing customer insights because today's insights are tomorrow's facts. At iResearch, we live and breathe insights. And despite searching high and low, we were unable to find a customer insights podcast that answers one of the most important questions in business. Why do customers do what they do? So we launched one. Hi, I'm your host, Darshan Mehta. On this episode, I'd like to introduce Gil Eyal. He's the head of marketing and innovation at Silverstein Properties Inspire, which is one of the management companies for Silverstein Real Estate Portfolio. Gil also supports startups under Stardust Ventures, which works with consumer-focused technology companies. He was an early player in the crypto space. He was a president also and founder of Hyper, a market leader in data-driven influencer marketing automation solutions, which was sold in 2020 to Julius Works. Gil was ranked one of the 30 most influential people in influencer marketing. Welcome, Gil. Thank you for having me. Great to have you on board. So you actually started as a lawyer, and you've had a couple of different paths in your career to where you've got now. So please share with me your aha moments that have got you to where you are now. I think the number one, maybe the first really big aha moment professionally I had was that um, we live in a society where you're really encouraged to know what you want very, very early on. And so that led me to go to law school and become a lawyer and work at a job I hated for for many years. And I think at some point it, it hit me that everyone's path is different and that you don't have to comply with a specific path to be successful. It's quite okay and really even better not to know exactly what you want to do uh, when you turn 16 and that your life isn't really a menu that you have to choose options from. Uh, things, Opportunities happen and the people that are really successful are people who know how to recognize those opportunities and make the most out of them. So um, towards the my late 20s, I realized I don't really want to be a lawyer. I really don't like it, but I was making relatively good money. And I uh, had, you know, a certain level of respect for my peers and uh, this really good horizon for my career. But I woke up and realized I'm not happy. I I don't feel like going to the office in the morning. I don't feel like staying late. I don't feel like working on the projects that I was working on. And I realized that that race, that 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 chase wasn't going to ever get me to a point where my life looked like I wanted it to. So I think that was a big moment for me. And um, what I encourage young people now when when I speak to them is to recognize that it's absolutely okay not to know exactly where you want to end up 20 or 30 years from now and to take a path that will have some mistakes in it. And you can always turn around and make a U-turn and go in another direction. You know, I think it's interesting. I think uh, many of us have probably gone through that where you kind of follow the path that society has you know, shown you. So you do this, do this, and then... You know, and then when you actually come out and you realize, hey, do I really want to do this the rest of my life for 20, 30, 40 years? And that's when you start thinking, hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's, uh, you know, a very good advice to tell young people is, you know, sure, you might like something, but eventually, you know, keep an open mind and, and go with what really makes you happy ultimately. And so I'm curious, what drew you to marketing and why do you love it? I think, you know, you're born with certain skill sets and things that I, that you're better at. And I'd always been a little bit of a, a chatty person, outgoing, a little bit of a salesperson. Like I could, I could spin a story to make things highlight the, the, the positives and things. But I, you know, I grew up, you know, didn't come from a very wealthy family, um, felt like I needed to make a good living and it felt like going into law would be much safer. Um, but um, I wasn't having a good time. I didn't really enjoy it. I was the parts that I did enjoy had to do with marketing the firm and getting new clients. And I came across this book called uh, Buzz Marketing by a guy named Mark Hughes. Um, somewhere in the 2000s, this book talks about um, the thought process that goes into creating buzz. And this was way before social media became a thing, and way before um, everything could be systemized. Everything could have a template. You know, we can understand, okay, you work with influencers or you, you buy virality. You had to create a story that the news would want to catch. And this book is amazing. I know it's outdated at this point, but if you're thinking about marketing as a career, I really recommend it's an easy read. It's, it's wonderful. And some of those ideas still are still useful today. Um, but what the book really does is it, it, it shows you how 
creative marketing can make can take something that has very very limited visibility and make everybody in the world want to talk about it and that really really drew me in and i felt like my mind works that way like wait i love seeing that that shiny little thing that you can highlight that is going to make people want to talk about it and that drew me in so i decided i'm going to get an mba um, in marketing and leave law behind thinking that the world was just waiting for people like me, you know? Um, so I, I, I applied to a bunch of MBA schools, um, got into a few, feeling that marketing was my calling. But at that point, I was much older than 18, felt like I really had a grasp of what I want to do, chose Kellogg, which is a school that is known for its marketing program. Um, and thinking that, hey, I'll go to Kellogg, you know, I used to be a lawyer, I have this great marketing mind. People will be all over me and found out that, hey, I can't even get an internship. People don't understand why a lawyer would want to go into marketing and um, going through a really, really challenging process of finding where I belong, but learning a lot about myself and realizing that, wait a second, marketing is my calling. Nice. So it sounds like that buzz marketing, even though it might not have been relevant for today's digital world, it gave you all the basics and the foundation that might have even led you to ultimately get into influencer marketing, right? So I'm curious, now that you've been through that path, what are the top three tips you would give someone regarding buzz marketing or influencer marketing that you really learn not only from the book, but also, you know, actually applying and, and, and doing it? Yeah. So the, the number one uh, tip that I remember from the book was that um, weakness can be strength. So they, they talk about a story about David versus Goliath and how that becomes very, very endearing to potential customers. And it creates a lot of interest in your story. In that story, it was in the ice cream wars. And I don't remember who was fighting who, but it was a small ice cream company fighting the giants and the giants were blocking their um, access to distributors. And it, it told about, it told the thought process behind how you leverage that to get sympathy, to get empathy, to get attention, and how that led them to build a really, really big brand. So number one is, you know, just because you're a smaller player, or just because uh, somebody might have a certain advantage of you over you financially or other ways, doesn't mean you can't craft a story that will get the audience interested in you. And from a marketing perspective, weakness can be very, very endearing. Um, so that's number one. Um, a great, great takeaway from that book. Number two is um, average, normal stuff doesn't get attention. Um, so I met this founder the other uh, day. Um, she has um, created the world's most comfortable pajamas and for women. Most comfortable pajamas for women. That's how she described it. And I said, you know, that's a really, really cool description. And she said, I thought of this really, really cool tagline, but I'm not going to use it. I was like, why aren't you going to use it? And she said, well, let me tell you the tagline. The tagline was the name of the product, sleeping your way to the top. And I said, why aren't you going to use that? She's like, nobody's going to invest in a company that says sleeping your way to the top, right? And I said, I will. That's the greatest idea ever because it, it, everybody's going to wonder what the hell you're talking about. You know, what is going on? Why is she using that term? And, you know, it's demeaning and all that. And then they'll realize, oh, she means comfortable pajamas. But if you just say, hey, the world's most comfortable pajamas, nobody's going to want to write about this. So I said, you need to have that hook. And I think um, the, so the second tip is don't be afraid to be a little outrageous, a little crazy. Think about how many brands have blown up because their story is crazy is unique. And then the third tip is kind of boring, which is, you know, you have to try a lot of things and test them. What gets tested gets better. If you don't test, you're not going to know. And so a lot of people will say, I have this crazy idea and they throw it out and it doesn't work. I say, yeah, wait, maybe it didn't work, but let's try it with this other angle. And a lot of these ideas that everybody's heard about, they started out as 10 other ideas that never worked and they slowly got there. Mm -hmm. So where do you see influencer marketing heading now? Uh, it's, it's been kind of uh, been entrenched now. People are taking, uh, you know, more light. I mean, attention to it. They're paying attention to it, and there. But where do you see it heading and, and changing? So I think influencer marketing is past its prime. I know that's not a uh, popular thing to say, but what I've seen, uh, the company I built, Hyper, was measuring um, influencer marketing metrics. And what we've seen is that the social networks have really changed the way that they treat influencers. Like in the past, having a lot of followers meant you would get a lot of viewership. Algorithms have come over and decided and are now um, the decisive factor in which videos get visibility. 
from an influencer marketing perspective, that's a really, really bad situation. It's very hard to hire influencers and predict how well they perform. And that's done by design by the social networks because they want you to advertise through their regular channels. But like similar markets, uh, when I came into influencer marketing, first I had to even convince people that this was a good idea, that people would want to get information through influential individuals. So that took a few years. By the time people got convinced with that, the social network started changing things. And now we're at the point where everybody's doing influencer marketing, but it's no longer as effective. One, because everybody's doing it. Two, because the networks have reduced the visibility um, that these videos can expect to receive. And so my advice when you're doing influencer marketing is to focus on the places where it does work. It does work in live streaming because the audience is actually there and you don't live stream passively. Usually you don't listen to live streams passively. You'll actually sit there and listen to what the people have to say. And if you don't want to, you'll leave. But if you're there, you're really there. And the second is with smaller influencers because the social networks are incentivized to give those influencers more visibility because they want them to stay on the platform. So if you can get a million people with 5,000 or 10,000 followers, they'll continuously create new content for you. But if you get one person with 50 million followers, that's just one person creating content for you. Um, and that person has a lot of power. So that's, that's in general, what I would say is like influencer marketing has shifted dramatically. If you want to do it effectively, you work with those types of influencers. You then identify which content the algorithms really, really like. And you invest money on getting more and more visibility for that content. So you might activate 100 small influencers. Three or four of them would do really, really well. Then you'd go and buy advertising and use that content to improve your marketing metrics. Interesting. So what, I know you're involved quite a bit with the startup ecosystem and uh, you know, small companies. What kind of mix would you recommend that they should consider doing for their digital marketing now uh, if they were going to initially do a lot of it on influencer marketing? Yeah. Generally speaking, most of the success comes to, uh, in influencer marketing comes to consumer focused companies. It's very hard to do B2B, very hard to do enterprise. You could do some things. We could talk about events with influencers and things like that. But generally speaking, the, the direct to consumer model or the B2C model is where things work well with influencers. However, uh, this idea that I would hire Mr. Beast and that would uh, automatically mean success. For my product is being challenged. We've seen that the Kardashians have had products that have been unsuccessful. Um, so yes, it can create a lot of visibility, but you have to do it wisely. Um, and you have to treat it with the same fundamentals that you treat other marketing channels. Meaning you have to understand what it costs you to acquire the customer through the influencer marketing channel. You have to optimize for low customer acquisition costs. So that means you have to identify which platforms work really, really well for you. What kind of messaging works really, really well for you? Which influencers are the ones that actually convert? And I'll give an example in a second. But then also, how do I amplify once these guys work? And how do I activate? How do I scale this? How do I activate a lot of influencers if this channel works? And then how do I match this with our digital marketing channel so that when content does well, that digital marketing channel can take that content and amplify it through our traditional channels, uh, which are the, the regular uh, digital marketing channels. Now, I'll, I'll say for an example, you know, if you're selling a uh, beauty product, it may be enough to have beauty influencers say, hey, I'm wearing this product. Look how good I, look how good I look. But if you're sharing a product or if you're selling a product that requires um, you to start a small business, it's not going to be as effective to find small business owners to say, hey, you should use this on your small business. It's much better to find people that teach you, to teach other people how to open small businesses because you need a level of credibility, a level of explanation. So each product is a little different, but you really have to think about who are the people talking about it. Are they just, do they happen to be people that would use the product or do we need a certain level of explanation, a certain level uh, handholding for the people who are going to use my product. And in that case, I really want to focus on influencers that are influential towards that audience because of the level of respect and education that they can provide. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like what you're saying is, uh, you know, focus on the engagement of the influencer, but also what type of engagement they're, they're seeking from this influencer. So yeah, look at some of the conversations and look at that and then take advantage of it based on that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. But engagement as a, as a metric has become really difficult because social networks, in, you know, throttle that engagement based on how they like the content. And if they recognize that it's promotional content, often they'll reduce visibility and that'll reduce engagement and so forth. So it's really about creating really, really effective content, seeing that the algorithms like it and, and it's a trial and error um, effort. 
and then putting budgets behind that. So tell me about the work you're doing in the uh, startup ecosystem and with startup ventures. And what is it you look for, uh, in particular for in, within startups, to see if they have promise? Yeah, so, so we seeing um, the challenges that influencer marketing is facing, I looked for where places where influence doesn't transcend social networks, isn't reliant on that. And I started Startup Ventures, which is, um, uh, along with my brother, we basically invest in consumer-focused startups where we can help them by matching them with big name celebrities. We have companies with, you know, we have a company with Gal Gadot that's a, uh, called Goodles, a healthy mac and cheese company. We just did um, with Victor Wimbanyama. We have a company in the energy and health health uh, drink uh, called Barcode. We have a variety of others. With, with the idea is that these are products that need to be attached to someone whose uh, involvement implies the benefits. So in the case of Goodles, it's healthier mac and cheese. Your immediate thought would be like, well, it probably tastes terrible. But our thought was that when people see Gal Gadot, they'll say, oh, wait a second. You know, one, moms love her and they trust her because she's so down to earth and she's a woman. Kids love her uh, because of superhero movies and the things that she's been in. And she has their trust. And then the, above all, we were like, I wonder if people ask themselves, what would Wonder Woman feed her kids? Well, healthier mac and cheese because all kids want to eat mac and cheese. Um, or if we look at um, Barcode with Victor Wimbanyama, this is a drink that's supposed to replace other drinks that are not so good for you, but they're being sold to athletes. Well, what would someone who's entering the NBA who could only use the best product possible because they need to make sure that they're eating healthy and drinking healthy and not getting injured, what would they be drinking? And that's why that match makes a lot of sense. The number one match in, in that I can think of is Nike and Mike, Michael Jordan. And I think it was so successful because he wore the shoes to the games. Like, why would he wear those shoes if he didn't think that they were the best shoes possible? He wouldn't risk his legs, his livelihood, his the number one thing that he's great at um, just for some money. He would have to pick really, really good shoes. And I think that testimonial doesn't need to be said. It needs to be demonstrated. <clears throat> sure, absolutely. I mean, it's the ultimate endorsement, right? Exactly. But the endorsement isn't just hey, I'm uh, Britney Spears and I'm drinking Pepsi because it tastes good. It's, hey, I'm using this and look, um, look why. You know, right. I'm the best at basketball and I'm using these shoes. Exactly. It's not like I'm just telling you to do this. I'm actually doing it, right? Right. <laughs> and I wouldn't, and I would never use something bad because these feet, my feet are really important to me. You've done a lot of work with celebrity endorsements. So I'm curious now, what have you learned, you know, that you didn't know at the very beginning, but now you've learned uh, the top three things that, you, that kind of surprised you, but... Now, you, now that you've been through, you say, okay, now that makes sense. I get it. I think the number one thing that um, comes with celebrity endorsements is how much people are willing to compromise on the celebrity endorsement side. I've had a brand come to me uh, and they had this life extension uh, uh, medication and they said they wanted to partner with a celebrity and the person that they uh, wanted to partner with was OJ Simpson. Mm -hmm. And I said, he's, why? Well, we know him. And I said, I know, but like, life extension? And I'm not saying he did it. Okay, I'm not saying he did it. Right, but, but the whole thing. There are a lot of people who think he did. I'll say that. Okay. Um, life extension is just not what I would tie to him. So I think what you find with a lot of these celebrity uh, deals is that people are so enamored by this idea that their brand would be tied to a celebrity that they don't think about the logic and what we were just discussing. Um, and a great example of like how to do it right is Smart Water and Jennifer Aniston. And Smart Water, uh, you know, one of the bottle brands, um, to my knowledge, not much, doesn't really have specific value above other bottled brands. But um, by tying it to Jennifer Aniston during her, uh, her prime, where everybody wanted her hair and everybody wanted her skin and having her hold the bottle and say, um, this is smart water. You don't have to make any claims. You don't have to say that there's vitamins in it. You don't have to say that it's from a unique source. It could be tap water. It doesn't matter because she's holding it. And I think it's very, been very successful for them. And then you see these other companies where they'll, in a, you know, let's say Kia and LeBron many years ago, where they hired him to uh, um, promote the, their cars. And, he, you know, the ad is ridiculous. You know, it's him in his enormous mansion of a house. And his kids are making noise and the phone is ringing and the, the gardener is making noise and he has no place to rest. So he decides to go outside. There's a Kia parked in his driveway. He sits in the back of the Kia. Literally, there's room for like eight of him in there. It's huge. And like this guy is, you know, he's 6'9 or whatever. And he's sitting there and it's finally the place where he can have some peace and quiet. And you're like, 
I don't think LeBron James would drive a Kia. Uh, that's not what you're known for. Like, nobody's going to believe that. And I don't think he could fit in the back of one. Or maybe he could barely fit in the back of one. But come on. You know, it's 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 ridiculous. Um, so, so you see that they were very excited about the size of his following and the attention he could get. But I don't know if that was the best choice. Um, so one, you know, finding the big name, I don't know if that's always the best thing to do. Um, the second is authenticity of the story. Um, there's a famous story of uh, um, Scott Disick, who was married to, uh, or who's, who I don't know exactly, he's, his, he shares kids with one of the Kardashians and he was on the show. And he promoted this t- uh, T-Tox thing, which is supposed to help you lose weight and clean your body. And I'm like, who's going to believe that you are using that? Like, I believe that you have a DUI. I believe that you all these things, but come on, like that, that story. And I'm not the only one. A lot of people didn't didn't believe it. Um, yeah, I think I think it's really about thinking um, a level deeper about how you're going to use a celebrity, what they're going to do for you, what kind of value they can create for you uh, is something that I'm always surprised to see that even some of the biggest campaigns don't do. Interesting. So I, I assume there's a distinction for you between influencer marketing and celebrity endorsement. And I'm curious, what is that distinction? Yeah, I think um, the term influencer marketing uh, implies that people have influence. Um, and it's not always the case, or in many, many cases, it's not the case. You know, the fact that you have amassed a significant followership on a social media platform is supposed to put you on equal footing with people who are in Hollywood movies who put out who have shown, demonstrated the ability to fill a stadium with 50,000 people. But it's not really that way, because if you think about the way you amass followership on social networks, it's over time. So I might, you know, I've been on Facebook for probably 14, 15 years now, and I maybe have 5,000 followers. But if you divide that by 15 years or 14 years, that's 300 a year. Um, So I think, think about somebody who has 10 million followers, but many of them followed five years ago. Or they, you know, they like the post, they followed, they forgot about you. The level of connection isn't always very, very strong online. And there's another factor that determines how much access you have to that audience that could be strong or weak. And so influencers, the term influencers, I was one of the early players in the space and instrumental in determine in, in calling it influencer marketing ended up not really being true. Um, most of these people just don't have any influence. They have visibility. They might be viewed as an expert on a, on a subject, but their influence is towards a much smaller group than you might think they do by looking at their follower count. With celebrities, it's not always the case. It, it, it's also kind of comes and goes, right, depending on what, where they are. Like athletes, if it's not during the season or if they don't control what they could drink or wear on camera, their influence is significantly limited. A talk show have a much stronger ability to impact their audience and 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 get seen regularly. So it really varies by the, the the channel with which you can reach your audience. And so if you have a podcast and you know exactly how many people listen to it every time, sorry, every time, then you're much more influential, in my mind, than someone who has the same amount of followers on Instagram. So I have a feeling kind of what you're saying is with, uh, with the right celebrity, you can have a deeper level of trust, authenticity, and everything that better aligns with your message. So if that's the case, you're better off doing a celebrity endorsement than actually influencer marketing. I, I think it, it really depends on whether they have a channel. But let's say, let's say, for example, we were trying to sell a product to women who want to marry rich men, right? So you could go and uh, advertise on TV. You could go and advertise, um, buy ads on Google. Um, and you could go and work with the millionaire matchmaker. Right. So each one of those things have different value, different uh, benefits for you. Right. On TV, tons of people will see it who are irrelevant to you, but tons of people will see it. Right. Google, the people who see it are people who actually search for this. So maybe that's really, really valuable for you. And we have intent. But then the millionaire matchmaker, if it's argue, arguable whether she has that audience. Right. But potentially you would say, OK, people who are interested in marrying millionaires are following her a really, really strong connection to the type of person who might be interested in this product, but also they admire her exactly for that reason. So if she says, hey, you should be dyeing your hair blonde, or you should be wearing this brand, or you should be doing this and that, then those people might listen to her. And I think those are 
um, areas where celebrities or influencers can be really, really powerful. But the other question is, wait, her show's no longer on the air. So can she reach that audience? So if you cast her while the show is on the air and you're able to sponsor the show and get her expertise in front of a very, very big audience, that's a really, really great situation. The problem with influencers is a lot of them, their show is no longer on the air. Yes, they have a lot of followers, but nobody's promoting their content. <laughs> so they need to still be relevant. Yeah, currently relevant. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, a lot of the celebrity endorsements and influence marketing, is, are you focused mostly on North America and U.S., or do you also do a lot of international? Yeah, we do almost in, entirely uh, U.S.-based activities, mainly because that's where our celebrity networks are. We do. We won't rule out something that's outside of the U.S., but generally speaking, that's where we've done most of our um, investing to date. It's mainly because we have the connections. You know, we, we need connections to retailers. We need connections to the celebrities. And so if we, where we, where can we create value for the startups that talk to us? Because I was curious if that varies internationally in terms of celebrity endorsements, you know, how it might work in certain markets overseas versus the U.S. Um, I've been doing some work in Asia, and I have a sense it, celebrity endorsements are very effective in Asia. I didn't know if you knew anything about the Asian market. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with it. I do know that, generally speaking, like one of the dreams is uh, for local brands to work with a a uh, US-based celebrity. I, I keep hearing that. I haven't had the chance of doing something like that. But back in the day, my company, Hyper, uh, provided technology for WPP to activate what they called key opinion leaders out there. And we learned just how valuable and how meaningful key opinion leaders are in that area. I think the US is, is following to a degree, but the social networks have evolved in a way that it's harder for influencers to gain a position of power. And TikTok that came here had already brought the experience that they had back home um, and structured their platform in a way that doesn't give influencers or KOLs or celebrities as much power as, say, the early days of social networks in the U.S. Interesting. So I'm curious, what, what do you see happening with AI and marketing and, and moving forward? How, how do you think that's going to influence uh, marketing and the tools we have at our disposal? I think a lot of the measurement is going to be built in-house. It's going to be much, much easier to track performance. And so people who can't provide marketing results will be kicked out. I think 99% uh, of influencers are a commodity at this point. And the only thing that will matter to brands down the road is whether or not they can produce results. Because we've seen that happen in every other marketing channel, right? Every channel that can't get measured is getting seeing significant declines in budgets going to it. The same thing is going to happen to influencers who uh, either can't get measured or can't produce sales, which is the, the metric that really matters 90% of the time. Um, so I think technology and AI will make it much easier to see who's talking about you, see whether that's creating real value for you. The second thing is, is that content will be much more uh, customizable, right? So um, people will be able to work with much smaller influencers. It's very, very hard to work with a thousand small influencers right now. It requires people to sit there and reach out and track whether they posted, measure each one of them, communicate with them, remember what you said to them, deal with the fact that some of them are late, some of them are early, but AI can do that easily. So that'll happen, uh, I think, very quickly. So on the influencer side, we'll see customized activations. We'll see very, very quick activation measurement decision if you're in or out and continuing an optimization with the ones that actually perform really, really well. And then we'll see different attempts of people to duplicate themselves, to create AI-based versions of themselves, to create content. We're seeing it now, the, the channels that don't have a face uh, will have a face. These automated content generation channels on YouTube will have a face and people will use it. Will it be just a gimmick? I think possibly. Um, it's not going to last down the road. Um, but we will see attempts to use, to leverage AI to replace basically every single thing a human can do in marketing. And I think in the, in anywhere where it's very analytical, we'll see effective efforts to do that. Wherever it's personal, you want to connect to the per person, you want to, I want the content from Darshan. I don't want Darshan bot to give me the content. It's going to be very hard to replicate, at least today. Interesting. Are there certain tools that you're using that you'd say uh, others should be taking a look at as well? Yeah, there's a uh, really interesting company out of Israel called DID, create um, really interesting, um, give you the ability to uh, scan yourself, have it read the stuff you've written and have people communicate and that can replace you. I don't think it's a long term game changer, but I think for someone like me that creates a lot of content, it's a great way to, to speak with a lot of people, maybe be kind of um, the guard at the door to see if I should personally take the conversation. I haven't used it yet, but I just read that Google released this thing that will attend Zoom meetings on your behalf. 
especially in meetings where you're not the main participant, but you have one or two questions or things like that. I think that's a really interesting angle, and I'd love to 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 try and use it. Um, and then I'm using a variety of tools. Uh, one that I just uh, started using is Twig, which helps you um, automatically evaluate um, how your marketing campaigns are doing using AI. So testing a variety of uh, wording, a variety of um, messaging type ideas automatically. Um, one other company that I really like is Octup, uh, O-C-T-U-P, which is um, basically helps people who do e-commerce automate their, their uh, sales channels and automate their uh, supply chain. And it saves them enormous amounts of money by negotiating with their vendors by identifying payments that they're being asked to make that they shouldn't be making or identifying channels that could replace that payment with lower cost activities, all using AI in really, really smart ways. Interesting. So what excites you about the future of marketing and, and especially digital marketing? It's kind of depressing, but it's also exciting. Is I think a lot of creative marketing is going to lose its footing. Um, budgets are going to shift more and more into things that are measurable and easier for brands to monetize and, and to evaluate whether it's effective. And the result is that we're not going to enjoy the entertainment that marketing used to provide us. Um, I'm of the generation that used to go early to the movies, so we wouldn't miss any of the commercials because we knew that those commercials were really entertaining. Um, they watch the Super Bowl for entertaining commercials, and I think we're going to see more and more formulaic behavior um, that's going to be less and less funny, uh, less and less entertaining. Um, or it'll be uh, almost AI designed to be within a template of something. So that's kind of a bummer. I am excited about the strength that marketing will have within organizations. For years, it was always kind of the first place to lose, fire their PR firm because there was no way to measure whether or not it was creating value. And it was asking. more and more measurement around this space will allow it to be a place that is um, positive ROI within an organization and a place that even during tough times continues to get budgets. So I'm curious, you've been doing this for a long time. So what do you think are the right KPIs, the top three that you've evolved and changed to that you think are the most important ones to really track and keep on top of? Uh, I think like before at the beginning, people might've looked at, you know, followers and counts. And I, I'm sure that's not one of the ones you look at anymore. So I'm curious, what, what are the top three KPIs you've learned that really make a difference uh, in terms of measuring your marketing and your digital presence? Yeah, I think the number one metric that has to happen is conversions. You have to decide what a conversion is for you, and you have to find a way to measure it. If you can't do that, it's not going to work. And I think um, for many, many years, people were satisfied with, um, oh, I got this many clicks, or this or we got this video got this many views. I think the market's shifting to a place where that's no longer effective, isn't considered a meaningful way to measure. So you have to focus on, number one, the metric is, does this convert? The second is once you figure out something converts is how do I reduce my acquisition costs through this channel? And it doesn't matter if you're in um, consumer business, in a SMB business, or really enterprise or anything else. It's um, have I found a channel that can actually convert to people signing up or paying or whatever you define as that conversion? And then how do I really, really reduce the cost in that channel? And then the third and final metric is can this channel scale? Is this something that I could do once and then forget about it? Like, People always ask me, hey, I got an opportunity to go on Good Morning America. Should I go? And I say, yes, you should go, but don't bother thinking that this will happen every three months. I guess you might get a bump in sales, you might get value, but don't think of this as a channel. Think about what, how do I identify channels like that um, that aren't too expensive, that'll generate a lot of sales for me, but I can do again and again and again, so I don't have to reinvest and reinvent the wheel every single time. Interesting. So you, you talk about an interesting thing here about that people are going more after performance tracking uh, and so on and so forth, and that creativity is going to be lost. So are you actually saying that there's going to be a greater opportunity for those who are creative to stand out and be different? I think similar. If, you, if you've been following what's happening with the writer's strike, I think um, similar to other uh, businesses, the really, really, really good ones or the ones that are really, really good at marketing themselves and building a reputation for themselves will always be in demand because those people will be the ones who can create content that proves that it's more uh, likely to get a click, right? Or to get somebody to sign up or to tell your story. Um, but this, the generation of uh, people that are just kind of following a template and that know how to optimize because they know best practices, those will be easily replaced by AI. And I think those people 
are going to have, a, and us as a society will have a big challenge. And I think similar to other places where creativity to date has been really, really valued, the value of that creativity will go down and be replaced by this value of, okay, this is how it works. This is how we make a superhero movie. This is how we make a commercial. These convert. So we'll just have AI design it and make another one for us. So it's always we may see the same old, same old. <laughs> but it's not uh, like it, it, true creativity yeah, can, can and will stand out. I think anyone who's the best will always uh, have a job. And anyone, you know, it's kind of, I remember from like uh, my undergrad business class, I, I forget the professor's name, but there was a, a basketball player in our year that was going drafted to the NBA and it was very, very good. You might mistake, look at him and say, hey, I should, my kid should go play basketball because that's a, 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 that's a good business. And the professor said something really, really that stuck with me, which was, Think about when you think about a business, assume you're if, if you're not the best, what's going to happen? Because very, very few get to be the best. Um, and a lot of it has to do with luck and timing and genes and who you know and what you know and where you were born. But you're just pretty good. Is this a business you can sustain and do really, really well on? And he was talking about how basketball we had, the, how hard it was to get on our school's basketball team and how only one of them is going to the NBA. Right. So and those people are like one in a million. So. I think like any other space, it's becoming more and more difficult if you don't really, really stand out to be successful. And AI is going to be very challenging to anyone who's not top tier. So what do you want to get into next in terms of digging further into in terms of the next big thing for you personally? What are you looking to investigate and learn more about and uh, and, and maybe to even implement moving forward? Yeah, my, my next investment is in... Uh, so I've been looking for the perfect product. The perfect product in my mind is one where... Um, you can, there's a very, very large audience pool that you can reach, uh, and you can reach them through channels that are repetitive, as I mentioned, um, and reduce your costs over time. Like the more customers you have, the, the cheaper it'll be to acquire more customers. But on the other side, it's also one where like, it's got very, very, very high customer, uh, uh, loyalty. Like once somebody starts using it, they'll never stop. And the space I'm looking at is, uh, this new medication that has been helping people lose weight. And the reason why I like this is because it has a lot of, uh, using it has a lot of the, the similar things to using drugs, right? How do people get you to use drugs typically, or like at least that's a fairy tale. They'll give you two or three hits for free and then you can never stop. Right? But with weight loss medication in the US, you know, 46, I think, or 42% of people are considered obese. That's an enormous amount of the population, right? And that this medication, and th these people have been taught over the years that they need to change the way that they eat, they need to exercise, they need to, to do all these things that they really, really, really don't like. And then they find out that they lose a little bit of weight and then their body starts fighting it because there's so many other things that happen like genes and um, temptation and just, you know, your body thinks it's starving. So it's, so it stops losing weight and all these things. In comes this medication. It changes your life completely. You just take this medication. Um, you don't need to change your habits. It's much easier. Everything is significantly easier for you. And, and suddenly you have this product that acts the same way as drugs because there's a ton of people who, who benefit from it. Um, not using it has a very horrible side effect, which is your, in this case, it's your health. In the drugs case, it's you might be depressed or life might be tough or all these other things. Um, but then once you start using it, if you stop, you'll, you'll gain the weight or you'll have to do all those horrible things like eat healthy and exercise. So I'm investing in that space and without getting into too much detail, because I think that space is extremely meaningful. Uh, it, it hits kind of all those buttons as far as like, once you solve it, you have an audience for life that you can create positivity for, but also make a lot of money. So if you could have a conversation uh, and lunch with anyone in the influencer space, celebrity space, or just marketing general, who would it be and why? I'm in love with Professor Scott Galloway. That's my guy. I have never met him, but I listen to everything he does online. I sometimes when people ask me, what do you think about something? I say, I, I haven't heard what Scott Galloway has to say about it yet. So I'm not sure I've formed my opinion. Um, so that's a guy I'd love to meet, really admire uh, his thought process and um, also his, his willingness to show his drawbacks and weaknesses and challenges in life. So those who may not be familiar with Scott Galloway, tell us a little about why you're drawn to him. He's an NYU professor who talks about business. He has a variety of podcasts. He was the guy who, um, who when uh, WeWork came out, he was, I think, the first guy to really, really publicly criticize their S1 filing. 
Um, and he does it all with a great sense of humor and, and some level of humility. Like he'll admit when he's wrong. He can also be very proud, but um, very entertaining, very smart, and um, just gets your juices flowing and your mind going. Nice, also, yeah. another handsome guy with a bald head. I mean, he's, he's really <laughs> <in the> movement. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds good. Well, listen, Gil, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I appreciate uh, all the uh, advice and tips and uh, recommendations you, you gave, and it's been very uh, enlightening and helpful. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. It's been so much fun. Getting to AHA was brought to you by iResearch. To find out more about us, head to iResearch.com. And make sure to search for Getting to AHA in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere else podcasts are found. And don't forget to click follow to ensure you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for listening.